I would like to welcome you all to this really important webinar, Why War? Finding Peace. My name is Karine Min. I'm a psychoanalyst with the British Society and a psychiatrist specialised in forensic psychotherapy working in the public health service. The world is in turmoil again. Another war has erupted, as Harriet has just been telling us, whilst other wars still rage on, and we know how many people are suffering terribly, experiencing horrific violent traumas no humans should ever have to live through. These horrors arise time and again in human history. But what have we humans learnt? Today's webinar is focused not on politics, but on what psychoanalysis can contribute to understanding not only how such large group processes arise, where perceived provocations and humiliations are responded to so violently on the background of potent historical and cultural aspects, where annihilation anxieties are mobilized as strategy and as response, but especially we want to focus on psychoanalysis as a tool for helping humans caught up in such conflicts to be treated and also towards finding peace. Please do look at the IPA website where there's already much information about how we can help those in distress, financially offering homes, providing appropriate consultations by phone or by Zoom at different stages and so on. We have our Ukrainian and Russian colleagues very much in mind today. Just to remind you all that the meeting will be recorded. And before handing over to the panelists, I'll explain briefly the format of how this webinar will function. So it has two sections. In the first, each of our panelists will give a seven to 10 minute presentation and these are their own views and not those of the IPA. These papers are available for you to download. The second se section is a question and answer portion devoted to the free exchange of questions and comments with the panelists and attendees. I apologize in advance that not everyone's question or comment will be able to be aired given our time constraints and the large number of people present. You will find a box on the right side of the screen. It's just being shown to you now. And if you'd like to ask a question, please write it in the box. You can post in this box throughout the whole webinar. But please note that selected questions and comments, um, they will not be referred to until our three presenters have finished their presentations and some time for their own exchanges. You can submit questions using the questions tab in your control panel. So now we're ready to begin and I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Viviane Chetrit vatin She's the former scientific committee chair of the Israel Psychoanalytic Society, also former president of that society, elected chair of the training committee at Ettingen Psychoanalytic Institute, and author of The Ethical Seduction of the Analytic Situation, The Feminine Maternal Origins of Responsibility Towards the Other, available in Hebrew and in French. The title of Viviane's presentation is Aspiration for Peace, an Ethical Exigency. Viviane, over to you. Ah, okay. Okay, thank you very much. 
So, uh, I'll make a certain number of points, and I'll tell you before which point. My introduction thought, I am just speaking about the fact that ethics, I am defining it as asymmetric responsibility for the other, as primary to any philosophy. I will have three points. You shall not kill, why war, how peace, and which peace. And in my conclusion, ethics as emotionally loaded asymmetric responsibility for the other as primary to psychoanalysis. So my introduction. Emmanuel Levinas, who considered that ethics is primary to any philosophy, defined ethics as asymmetric responsibility to the other. He was able to reach this understanding after considering and taking into heart the meaning of the Shoah, the eradication of humans by humans, and he wrote, the intersubjective relation is an asymmetrical relation. In this sense, I am responsible for the other without waiting for reciprocity. Reciprocity is this affair. Following Levinas' thinking and its combination with Laplanche, generalized seduction theory, I have proposed a new psychoanalytic hypothesis concerning the very origin of this human capacity of responsibility, and I have suggested that it is connected with the feminine maternal existing in any human subject. On the one hand, as a result of the violence of the ethical shock provoked by, in parents by the encounter with the alterity of the neonate and then the child, we will have a process of transformation recurring over and over again that will lead in these adults to the formation of an ethical psychic space, a matricial space. By this expression, I wish to define the adult caretaker ethical position of responsibility for the child from the beginning of his or her life, and by the same token, the analyst ethical space-time position of asymmetric responsibility for his, her patient, and the entire analytic process <clears throat> from the first encounter of the analytic diet. On the other hand, the violence of the ethical shock caused by the adult, in the adult, by the encounter with the neonate and then the child, provoked the emission by the adult of enigmatic ethical messages. These parental messages compromised by the repressed unconscious are preferred during the recurring transformation occurring in adult psyche following the ethical shock I spoke about before. They will leave traces in the infinite, infinite zone of the child psyche. These traces stay, in my view, at the very origin of each human subject ethical capab capability, and they will facilitate later on the transformation of the child and then the adult's sexual death drive into the sexual life drive. Today, I propose that the human aspiration for peace is intrinsically linked to this ethical requirement, which is with, with which uh, a child is coming to the world, best said to this ethical exigency. Freud called it a trusting expectation, and I see it as an ethical requirement which entails an interpolation of an avoidable responsibility of the adult world for this child. You shall not kill. For Levinas, murder is only possible when one has not looked the other in the face. Thou shall not kill are the first words of the face. In other words, the impossibility of killing is not of the order of reality, but of the order of ethics. I see this comment forbidding killing as related to the menace presented by the very fact of encountering the other, the alterity of his or her otherness. This encounter touches to the other in myself. It refers me to the stranger in myself, to the repressed and conscious part of my psyche, to what is menacing in myself and thus disturbs me. But at the same time, the face of the other is denuded and fragile. My positioning as a human subject, and I will add, as a psychoanalyst, requires me to be capable of responding to this distress 
and it is up to me within myself to find the resources to respond to it. But Levinas has asked, does not lucidity, the mind's openness upon the truth, consist in catching sign of the permanent possibility of war? And he insists, the state of war suspends morality. From the beginning, its shadow falls over the acts of men. In other words, war runs moral derisory. So why war? Why war? If Freud terminology is marked by metaphors of war, the very sense of conflict in psychoanalysis stands in contrast to the common use of the term, since for psychoanalysis, war is a sign of conflicts unable to be metabolized, the sign of unbreadable drive activity. 1933, Einstein wrote to Freud, and his response, Freud came back to the question of the death drive, a drive of aggression and destruction. With the jouissance linked to the same drive, the origin of the possible atrocity or violent acts. This is why Laplanche spoke of a sexual death drive. The human being, he said, is a man for man and not a wolf for man. Capable of the sadism, he can be much more cruel than any animal. And Levinas was to write after Auschwitz, arising from human relationship. Violence stands on the edge of abysses where at certain moment, everything can founder, including reason. Motivation for war may be linked to idealization or rather to the sacralization of the cause for which one is fighting. Sacralization of the fatherland to be defended body and soul. Sacralization of the process in the case of so-called holy wars. Sacralization of the leader who indicate the past to be followed. Sacralization of the sacrifice to be paid with one's life to defend his name or that of God or of the God. Is it not on such a sacralization that the discourse of leaders is founded? For adding to our understanding of the capacity of men to destroy and kill, let's also remind us that together with the possible activation of sexual death drives, we meet the centrality of the use of splitting. Maria Marilia Eisenstein has insisted in her intervention this last Sunday with our Russian colleagues upon the destruction of thinking and the processes of representation. She has proposed that the subject would disappear as if dissolved in a strange submission to a figure of authority which is sometimes ungraspable. ungraspable. Then one must want then one must not think about or picture things, words must not evoke image or affect. And to resume, I obey, I obey, therefore I don't think. Splitting, though exist in manifestation, manifestation of obedience and conformism in submission to authority. And she spoke of conformist dementalization while she proposed that dementalization is an anti-traumatic strategy under the sign of survival, when repression and negation are no longer effective against anxiety and unbelievable affects. So how peace? And which peace? What is the path that led from violence to right, asked Einstein to Freud. In other words, how to reach peace? But Freud was not very, very optimist. We will have always to deal, he said, with the return of the request it cannot be forgotten that law was originally brute violence. Nevertheless, Levinas wrote after World War II, after this five years captivity, after the cruel death of his parents and sisters, moral consciousness can only sustain the mocking gaze of politics if the certitude of peace dominates the events of war. So what kind of peace? Founding the ref his reflection on Talmudic texts, Levinas speaks of a peace that will not be the result of one nation submitted to the other's national power. It will be no more question of the law of the stronger. Peace will result for the re from the respect of this one by this one, from a position of proximity, of vulnerability, from a position respecting its singularity, its culture, its language, its customs. Peace 
will result from a position of responsibility toward the other nation. Renaud Ben Pazi reminds that Kant has suggested that for a nation to be in relationship of mutual respect, they have to get organized into federation. Still, more radically speaking, for Levinas, peace is, is in connection with infinity. The harsh law of war breaks up not against an important subjectivism cut off from being, but against the infinite, more objective than objectivity. From here, my proposition today has been that aspiration to peace viewed as ethical exigency evolves from the psychic cyclical zone of infinity, a zone belonging to any human being. And I will conclude. Ethics as asymmetric responsibility for the other as primary to psychoanalysis. Human beings cannot be reduced to their sexual death drive. They are capable of responsibility for the other. It does exist a capacity to transform a sexual of death into a sexual of life. And it is precisely in the light of the above, that I have proposed to define our practice, the stone that we can contribute to the construction of this world in which we live. While analysis is a practice that endeavors to find a way of approaching the unconscious, it is a practice based on speech, addressing the other and listening to the other. It favors the transformation of a sexual of death into a sexual of life, as it implies an asymmetric encounter between two subjects with the living presence of the analyst and for me, his or her ethical wakefulness. The ethics of the contemporary psychoanalyst, taking into account the traumatic events at the heart of which, and as a result of which our world is struggling, will be defined both as an ethic of truth and as an ethic of asymmetrical and emotionally loaded responsibility for the other. This ethic will be understood not only as deontology, but as intrinsic to our practice. Finally, with Levinas, after the Shoah, after Rwanda, and now in this terrible moment when crimes are perpetrated by humans against humans, I will certainly not say that man is a saint, but that he knows nonetheless that holiness is indisputable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vivian. Um, I'll go straight to introducing uh, our second speaker. And it's a real pleasure to introduce Ricardo Riadi, psychologist, psychoanalyst, member of the Chilean Psychoanalytic Association, who completed a master's in psychoanalytic study at the studies at the Tavistock Clinic in London. Ricardo is also Latin American co-chair of the Committee for Psychoanalytic Assistance in World Crises and Emergencies, referred to as PACE, P-A-C-E, and you can read more about this on the website. He's also published a lot on his work in community mental health and co-authored Psychoanalytic Understanding of the Chilean Political Transition. The title of Ricardo's talk is War, Invasions and Current Global Narcissistic Contagion, Distinctive Contributions from Our Psychoanalytic Mentality and Activity. Ricardo. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'm not sure how much I can share on these two main topics between mentality and activity. Maybe in, in the further discussion, I can share some of what we are doing at PACE and how it can be connected with, with the ideas I want to share with you. Um, I want to start from Freud's paper and think about the journey he's taking in it from totem and taboo to civilization and its discontents to pinpoint an idea about what he thinks and what he's trying to share with Einstein is a kind of chronic problem 
that was not really dealt with in the League of Nations and that we want to uh, we would want to include in this um, current situation. There's um, well, the, the totem and taboo is mainly about the development of law and how violence is part of law and law is still an expression of violence. He, he would describe this transition from the dominance of the powerful individual submitting the weak to the power of the unity between the weak to submit the powerful individual. So there's a, a marvelous, I, I love this book, a marvelous development um, in his uh, thoughts about it, of how community gets to be in charge of controlling the violence, but using violence at the same time. It's intellectual violence, but it's restrictive for the individuals, for all of them. And what, what he's including here is the, he would link it later in this paper with the problem of inequality in this unity. So he would develop the idea that one of the problems that we could perceive in this global institution, that now it's not the League of Nations, it's the UN, is the idea that there are unequal powers in it and that there's a risk for it to be corrupted. He doesn't use those words, but he's talking about that, about how this organization could serve um, to deepen the inequalities more than be representative of the whole as a global achievement. Now, having said that, I must include my experience and interest in working with groups. It's very difficult for me to see, you know, a, a division between good and bad and not link it as a reaction, as a context of, you know, complex interdependence as a system. Now, he, going back to Freud, he carries on with civilization and its discontents. With the main idea about how the death drive with its, with its expression in aggression and violence is administrated within the community. So the discontent is about restriction of the death, the death drive. And he, in that paper, in Civilization and its Discontents, describes in a, in a beautiful way, the way how uh, aggression is, when it's not expressed toward the other, to, toward the others, is directed inwards and it's, and it fuels the severity of the superego. What I understand of Freud's exchange in Einstein, with Einstein is that he's talking about the usefulness of considering this need to restrict aggression, to strengthen a kind of community superego that is hard enough on its members. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a, a big sacrifice for, for everyone mm -hmm. involved. So um, I think he's moving between these two texts and at the same time insisting on, on the importance of having an ethical, using maybe Vivian's, uh, the, 
way she shared the concept of this ethical uh, responsibility hmm, of making as equal as possible the influences in this organization. Hmm. Now, what, what I think it, it could be interesting and I wanted to share with you and hope this stimulates some participation on, on our colleagues, is the link with, with a, a gang-like gang mentality as described by Meltzer and Rosenfeld in the sense that there's something about uh, corruption when these institutions fail in inequality and they are serving some kind of individual interests they are corrupted and they pervert its meaning and that has some kind of um, correlate in the institution of, of authoritative regimes as we are you know somehow dealing with indirectly mm -hmm. um, with the perverse propaganda you know of confusing what is right and what is wrong finding all sorts of justifications for doing the wrong mm -hmm. um, Well, of course, narcissism includes this idea of projecting the vulnerability on the neighbor, right? And attacking the recipient of that uh, projection. Um, and I think that in that sense, we all know through psychopathology how boundaries are blurred and end up being meaningless. Um, yeah, Karen, I'm not sure if, if I'm on time, but just wanted to introduce the subject. You're silenced. Ah, I've just been unmuted. Um, you have a couple more minutes, Ricardo. You have a few more minutes, three more minutes. So what I, what I think is something useful in, in this um, stance that Freud is taking is that he is talking about, he even uses the concept of a biological excuse. He would tell Einstein, look, there is this aggression that, you know, there's something about um, human nature in it. What it's in the common sense is that people will attack others to avoid being killed or to defend themselves. But Freud includes another vertex to it, and it is about how aggression to others is a way to avoid self-destruction through an augmented severity of the superego. So I think that in, that, in this sense, the role played by an international organization who can administrate the superego, the, this common superego, can, can really uh, contribute. But having said that, it must be uh, ethical enough. So that what something that he is included in this paper is mm. so that identification processes, mm, the strength of identification processes are really, um, you know, used. So the condemnation of certain situations as we are doing and uh, being open about condemning this uh, invasion to Ukraine is something that should be replied in other situations that can, you know, help the rest of the global community identify with victims and with the reaction you know, I think there's something about that that makes me think about how um, Freud's idea of the this corrupted organization that can be naturally, you know, working um, for other uses, not for the global welfare, must be 
you know, constantly work through. I think with that, I have, you know, highlighted some main ideas we could pick up from. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, it's also an honor for me to introduce our third speaker, Zveri Varvin, MD, Doctor of Philosophy, Training Analyst with the Norwegian Psychoanalytic Society, and Emeritus Professor at Oslo Metropolitan University. He's worked clinically and carried out research on traumatization and treatment of traumatized patients, particularly in the refugee field. He's done process and outcome research on psychoanalytic therapy, research on traumatic dreams and on psychoanalytic training. He has been president of the Norwegian Psychoanalytic Society twice and has held several positions in the IPA. He's currently chair of the IPA China Committee. Sveri has published articles and books on his research on traumatization, refugees, and on terrorism. The title of his talk is The Situation of Refugees Today. What are their needs and how are they met? Sveri, over to you. Thank you, Karin, and thanks for inviting me to this webinar. I will start uh, as uh, Ricardo uh, with the letter of Freud to Einstein. Uh, Freud underlined uh, there were some antidotes to war. One was the ties of sentiments between people, that is identification between people. And there was strengthening of the intellect. I think this refers also to the ethical position and the introversion of aggression. Now we see destruction of ties of sentiment has taken place for a long time between Russians and Ukrainians. There is a massive propaganda of lies that has weakened the intellect and aggression is directed towards the other, to the Ukrainians. My topic is refugees. And I want to um, just state the obvious fact that this kind of social violence and human rights violations regularly, regularly have dehumanizing effects. People are in context of war and terror, regu terror regularly exposed to degrading treatment. And I uh, will say a few words about how this hinders possibilities for healing. Uh, and what must, um, uh, what kind of measures that must be taken on an individual level, group level, and also cultural and social levels, and also some words about the role of psychoanalysis. Uh, I've been researching uh, and studying the refugee fields for many years, and uh, me and my colleagues, we have become increasingly aware of the, that refugees are regularly dehumanized, not only in their home country, but uh, also in other contexts. Uh, and uh, in contrast, we have psychoanalysis as a humanizing enterprise. Its tasks with dehumanized people is rehumanization you know, on the individual, but also on group levels. And I see that in, in this context, we need to have a holistic view on the traumatized person and the refugees. We must see the body soul, the individual group, the group society and culture in context. Uh, and I want to underline that dehumanization is a psychological process, uh, interpersonal process denying human characteristics to other people. It is a process that results in the perception of others as less human or non-human. And consequently, as we know, it can lead to actions or behaviors which 
can endanger existence, safety, uh, or rights of certain individuals. And we know examples, uh, of course, from, from history, Jewish peoples were described by Nazis as vermin in Rwanda, Tutsis were described by Hutus as cockroaches, uh, and there are many examples from the Balkan War. So dehumanizing propaganda becomes connected with the preparation for genocide. In connection with the war on Ukraine, it's important to know that Russian propaganda for a long time has prepared the public to accept that the Ukrainian people are misled by fascists, and that military action is the right answer to save the people. Many Ukrainian who do not accept this are, per definition, less than human, in the same way that opponents in Russia are like insects and traitors that need to be cleansed from society. These words were used recently by Putin. This is uh, explicit pre-genocidal ways of speaking. Uh, and it's uh, uh, been a propaganda full of lies, and people may know that it is lying, but uh, when it's repeated like this, the, the public uh, are put in a state of paralysis, para paralysis as you described, Vivian. The intellect is, you know, stops functioning. So unwanted elements, uh, insects and traitors can be cleansed by, or exterminated. And this libera liberating so-called military action then becomes ruthless. The destruction of Grozny in Chechnya, destruction of uh, Aleppo in Syria are recent examples, but there is a long uh, history of example uh, from Stalin's terror where populations were displaced and so on. And in this situation leads, of course, to extreme traumatization of people, and it lasts in generations. And we have lots of studies, and we know it from the clinic, how um, the dehumanizing and uh, destruction of uh, one generation puts a heavy burden on the next generation, and so on. So I, I think that um, uh, the, in the preparation to wars, uh, there are so there are dehumanizing uh, discourses and dehumanizing be behavior, <clears throat> and this is very much uh, the experience uh, of refugees uh, uh, in in different contexts. You know, it's been. Uh, an enormous increase of number of displaced people in the world, you know, refugees and also internally displaced people. Uh, only last year it was approaching 85 million, and now probably approaching 95 million people. And it's increased almost exponentially the last 10 years. Now they are uh, coming uh, refugees in very high number to different countries in Europe. And what we see now is uh, an extreme uh, common effort to receive them with help and dignity. People are offered uh, protection, uh, what we call the group protection. All Ukrainians are accepted without questions. They are offered opportunity to work, kindergarten, school, uh, living conditions, and so on. And this is uh, an enormous effort in so many European countries now, including my country. But other refugees or displaced persons around the world uh, are li living under quite extreme, difficult conditions. So the welcoming of uh, refugees from the Middle East, from Syria, Afghanistan, from Burundi, Congo, Burundi, Congo, and so on, has largely dried out. Uh, and what we have also documented in the late years is how refugees 
uh, are experiencing uh, quite heavy conditions during flight, even more traumatized during flight than in their home country in some uh, research. And this is not only by smugglers and bandits, it's by official people, it's by the border controls, the police and so on. So uh, violence is a part of war. Uh, torture, rape and killings uh, of civilians uh, is an extreme but very regular outcome. And there is, uh, we cannot blame this on uh, this certain group of sadistic or, or bad people, but they are also put in action in this context. But one of the worst problems is the silent majority who are uh, not explicitly supporting, but they are the, fa the, the big failure of the witness is an extreme uh, devastating uh, experience for refugees. Uh, and um, we know also that the moral uh, moral injury by being traumatized and not recognized is something that is um, uh, makes things worse in the in the in the long run for the traumatized. So what happens afterwards so to speak, when people have been traumatized, when they arrive the country, uh, what, what happens then is very decisive for the outcome. So how we welcome refugees, how we take care of traumatized uh, is uh, decisive for uh, how it goes in the long run and also for the next generation. And here I think uh, psychoanalysis has a very important uh, contribution to make because we know uh, how uh, important uh, this recognition of uh, the traumatized, the victim uh, are uh, when they come to another situation. And the psychoanalyst has been too much in the background, I think, because we have the knowledge and we could use it much more. So, uh, uh, we need to know that uh, uh, being a refugee is, is uprooting from uh, not only the physical home, but very often the mental home. So one of the prime tasks of refugees is to create uh, not a psychic home in uh, exile. And the psychic home is a quite important uh, concept. And what we can de do in the beginning is as a psychoanalyst, it's not primarily therapy, uh, but we can use our psychoanalytic knowledge to help people understand the complex process of regaining humanity, build relations, and slowly rebuild the psychic home. And this must start from the beginning. And you must take care of vulnerable groups, mother, child. And we know that now with the Ukrainian refugees. But this has been really a neglected area. Many mothers and children have been neglected. Uh, and psychological counseling is important and psychological therapy will be important. We have to build up a competence, uh, uh, recruit psychoanalysts to do this uh, important long-term therapy. This will start uh, after a while. And then we must learn to work with interpreters and so on. And we, we need to take the whole person and the family and the relation between the parents and the children and so on into consideration. And we must not uh, adhere to very simplified concepts of traumatization, especially PTSD, too red reductionistic, too simplified. So uh, I will uh, have a, I, will, I will end with a kind of uh, message that that we can con we can uh, contribute uh, to uh, uh, important and uh, massive rehumanization for those who have been traumatized, for those who have been forced into exile, and, we, and not the least we can stay, we can endure because. 
what, what happens, there is no short-term solution to these problems. And psychoanalysts know how to stay with our patient and to be there for a long time, which is needed at least for many of those who have been uh, severely traumatized. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sverre. Uh, three amazing presentations. Thank you so much to discuss the ethics, the identifications, the transgenerational traumas, the long-term impacts of the dehumanization, the rehumanization, the importance of all the different entry points for, for treatments. And I'd like to now invite our three esteemed panelists to discuss between themselves before they begin to respond to comments and questions. Who would like to start? As you said, yeah. Yeah. Ricardo, as you said, you, you, you came back to the proposition of Freud about uh, what can make peace, uh, to make a community and uh, to have laws and so on. And uh, you stress also the fact that what Freud also said that uh, very difficult uh, when we are making a community uh, to spare inequalities and then uh, uh, who are making the laws, the rulers, the leaders, and uh, when the leaders and generally are quite corrupted because they have a lot of strengths. So in, in fact, the laws that are, that are made are, are laws that are bringing with them the violence. And uh, you refer to a totem and taboo. And um, I remember that uh, um, once I uh, was uh, uh, interested, I've been interested by totem and taboo and voices and the monotheism. And uh, what, I, uh, what I saw that uh, there is a discussion between Freud and Atkinson. Atkinson was an historian. And uh, Atkinson said that. Uh, for the, the, the struggle and for the violence to stop once, there is a need maybe of a, a mother that is sometimes said to a, 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 a son, you just stop, you stop with that. And, uh, and Freud then said that Atkinson did not know what is uh, psychoanalysis because in his understanding, if there was, a, if there is a stop at the end of the of this uh, fight, that's because of uh, uh, the uh, guilt uh, of having uh, murdered the father and so on. But what I have proposed that for the law not to be a fascist law, not to be the law of a ruler, uh, it has to be taken in consideration the ethic of responsibility before the law. And, uh, and when there is not this aspect, the law goes on and goes on and wars are going on and going on. And uh, I think that we have something to say about that. And we can say that's maybe um, like uh, illusory or like uh, a dream. Mm -hmm. But I think that we have to, to aspire to that. We have to, to bring a message in this direction. That's, uh, that's what I wanted to, to stress here once more. I think that's very important. What's, uh, what's there uh, told us about the refugees, the fact that uh, today uh, we are seeing a lot of solidarity from one part, but we know also that there are a lot of refugees that they are bringing uh, or they are encountering a lot of xenophobia, a lot of uh, uh, reject, and uh, uh, compassion is not enough. Uh, people have to understand that to meet, as you said, Sibir, with, a, with a, a stranger, um, that is something which is making us not at ease, and uh, how we can deal with that, and how we can uh, overcome that. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we have to say something about that. Mm. 
because we are not just good people. We, are all, we have a lot we know. We have a lot of hate poten potential in ourselves also. Svere or Ricardo, would you like to respond to Vivian? <laughs> yeah, well, I just wanted to make one point because uh, uh, exactly we are not good people, but we are. The worst thing is the, the ignorance and uh, uh, that we uh, see that people are treated in a bad way by the ways of rules. Uh, it's it's also laws. Uh, and uh, uh, the suffering of these groups of people are hidden from our eyes, so to speak. And then we know a bit and then we accept it. This is what's called structural violence. And I think that we can be much more active in making aware of how people uh, not only are uh, massively dehumanized or maltreated, but also this kind of uh, silent, uh, 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 structural uh, uh, kind of violence that people are exposed to. Uh, we know people are in these refugee camps, but we don't care uh, in a way. And we can we, we see we have we need need to see uh, things, and we need to make also public awareness about these things. Mm. Yeah. I I would. I would add something following Vivian's um, comment that I think you're right, Vivian. I think that it is not enough, for example, sanctions or or statements. You know, and we need them definitely. I, I mean, and maybe Karen is more specialist in this it, regarding like how, in in a clinical sense, we need to control acting out. Mm. So that we can carry on in a more um, in the, in a working through process, and the, so that's only part of it. Uh, that's why I think that there must be a balance also with this. Um, I'm not sure if I'm using the the right concept, but but I think it it could it could work like the ethical value of the group of representatives. Mm -hmm. function functioning because they need to give an example exactly that, that's what i mean so so both condemning um, sanctioning and and all that but at the same time using this chance to work some of this through for future events because this will not end mm. i mean this this is happening everywhere in all regions in different ways Fortunately, this situation has gathered many of us together and has made us work a lot. But there's something about giving an example, because in this case, it is Russia. But Russia, in my point of view, represents something that is in every country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so that, that's something I think that psychoanalysis can can contribute with, like not um putting that only in that you know um in that um aggressor in a way Ooh. i think that we can all agree agree with you because uh, that's what i tried to say we have this aggression possibility in each of us huh? and uh, mm. you're very true to say that but i remember that uh, Freud said that uh, he wanted to imagine uh, leaders that could be people very intelligent and they could make uh, something of like that. He even spoke about dictature of reason, and you know, that people, that mm. there will be leader with a, a capacity to be just reasonable. Yeah. What you are saying that uh, would be good if we had leaders that were able to be responsible and uh, will be able to, to care about the people they are leading. The problem mm. that we are in front of, that, uh, what kind of people gets to lead any election. That's what happened in all the nations today. What kind of people mm. are, are, are going to this kind of task. It's, and you say, and you are, you are correct, uh, the leader is uh, in a position of a great, 
uh, father, like a figure father, figure parental figure, and there is a need for identification. So with whom uh, people are identifying, that's a problem. Yes. Do you think that all that there should be a requirement for all political leaders to be psychoanalyzed? For example, it's a different yeah. I, I remember that the, somebody told me that in Germany, for example, at some time, there was a requirement for the judges to be psychoanalyzed. I don't know today what's going on, but sometime there was something like that. No, no. Psychoanalysis is not enough. We, don't, we know that also. You can be so called well analyzed and something goes. We are not uh, just uh, holy people. We know that. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't have any answer. Uh, we are also to be to be in front of the fact that we don't have answers. What are we doing without answers? Well, we're keeping trying and keeping thinking, and this is a yeah. very important process that we're part of today, all of us. Would yeah. would any of the three, if you like, to make an, uh, another? Uh, uh, to say something else before I look at the um, questions from from the attendees, I may may I tweet or beer? Go ahead. No, no I, well, I was just to, I want to say that in this situation we all sense uh, a, we have a feeling of quite profound helplessness. Uh, and uh, this is a helplessness that uh, is uh, uh, beyond very much that has we, we have felt earlier with earlier crises because this the threat of mass destruction used to used to weapons of mass destruction this threat of the th uh, world war three and we are together we are trying to cope with this helplessness and one way of coping is, of course, to, to do some meaningful works with refugees, mm -hmm. uh, which, which are done very much in the European context. Uh, but we should, be, we should know, know that we, we as psychoanalysts have a, a, a listening and containing capacity that can be used in different contexts. And, and we should uh, really take care or to, to, to be there and use it. And we have to then also work with our own feeling of helplessness. So. Mm -hmm. Ricardo? Following on, on what Svere is saying, um, maybe just a, a small introduction to, to if and if uh, I have the, the chance to share some of PACE's activity. Um, no. Oh, hmm. I, I was very struck by, by, by this idea that refugees have a, a more or, or a very traumatic experience in their, ex, in, in their you know, experience of being a refugee, more than in their home countries. I think that's uh, incredible. I mean, I can understand it, but how important it can be for us to intervene at that level um, even when not all can be uh, treated like clinically in psychotherapy we are um, working with groups trying to help the helpers organizations that receive them that's our aim mm -hmm. And just thinking about this, how important it could be for these people to have a humanizing experience of reception and, and not maybe not necessarily very deep interventions, I mean interpretations. It's mm -hmm. about you know contact, human contact. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. I, I work with the Ukrainian Association in Norway. Uh, and I think the uh, I organize psychoanalysts to work with them. I think this is quite helpful, as you say, to to be there, mm -hmm. be there with them. Yeah. Of course, the first thing required is shelter, warmth, food, mm -hmm. safety, mm -hmm. and yeah. then 
to 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 be heard before we mm. would you know as you were saying ricardo uh it doesn't have to be a deep psychoanalytic interpretive uh mm. not at all and certainly not at the beginning would be contraindicated um can i, what, can I yeah sorry this one small thing is that what i think that uh, i'm not sure is where you can please correct me if i'm wrong but what you are pointing at is also the split that there can be between the the concrete reception, shelter, food, and all mm -hmm. that, and the attitude mm -hmm. that's behind those provisions. Yes, I think that's very yes, yes. and we we can we can really influence the attitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we have to go into the refugee camps and uh, and so on, but we can supervise in different ways. So I yeah. think that's a really good point. I think that uh, we are touching with uh, uh, something which is something happening also in children. Uh, what I wanted to say then, that everyone comes to life with expectation to be trusted and to, to find somebody to trust in. When people are coming as refugees, they are, as you said, in an helplessness situation. There is a regressive kind of position, and there mm. are an expectation of finding some people that you can trust in them. You can have, you can trust in them. And when what you get is a reject or is a very bad condition and so on, that's un unbearable. That's unbearable because the position of quite a regression of any people in a situation of to be a refugee. I think that it was make the thing so yeah. so terrible. I think. Yeah. Let let me um, let, um, speak to you about the, the, the first question uh, from one of our attendees. I wonder if the speakers will share their thoughts on the recent destruction of a maternity ward in Ukraine, destruction of the maternal space, dehumanization of the other. And even babies. I, I try to 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 bring what uh, Marilia Eisenstein has proposed. Mm. Um, uh, I think that uh, something is going on in terms of uh, dementalization uh, about obeying to the authority and not thinking about it. Um, and to be in a situation of deconnection about what's going on. And I guess that uh, the, the soldier or the people that send the bomb on this hospital and so on were completely deconnected what, what they were doing. And uh, so when we are looking at that in the TV and so on, that's unbearable, unbearable. Mm -hmm. I am not sure that the uh, people that were sending bombs were in connection with it. There was a target, mm -hmm. they had to obey, they don't have to think, they don't have to represent anything, they don't have to, mm. yeah. And probably they don't get to know what they are targeting. Mm. So the, the soldiers are dehumanized as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So the that's soldiers. a very, very sad thing, yes. What would you say from a psychoanalytic perspective, what consequences should there be for the aggressors for this to never repeat and or to encourage healing? It's a very, very difficult question to address, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, well, the, the legal part, we cannot uh, really say something about this. Uh, that's the case for the criminal court or international criminal court. But uh, sometimes the aggressor is coming to therapy and uh, then we have a huge task of uh, helping, helping them out of this. I've been treating child soldiers, for example, which is really a uh, difficult way to, 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 to achieve some kind of humanness again. Mm. Uh, the, the big question now what to do with the aggressors is uh, something for the uh, the International Criminal Court, I think. Well, I think psychoanalysts also have a, a part to play in, in treating okay. perpetrators and offenders. Mm -hmm. eh? 
yes, yes, yes. You have you have experienced, yes, yes. <laughs> um, this this is a question that is addressed, you know, to all three of you. For any of the panelists, how do you explain the world rallying for Ukrainian refugees, but not in the same way for those attempting, for example, to flee uh, Afghanistan? I did not get the question, Karen. I did not repeat it. How, how do you explain the world rallying for the Ukrainian refugees? Uh, se précipite pour uh, s'occuper vite des Ukrainiens, uh, but mm -hmm. not in the same way for those attempting to flee Afghanistan. I've been thinking a lot about that because mm -hmm. it's quite amazing how the Ukrainians are received now. Uh, uh, we don't know how it will work in the long run, of course, but it's, uh, I think, uh, what what Freud pointed to, that there is some ties of sentiments, there is identification because they are more similar to us in Europe than people from Afghanistan and even from Syria or from Burundi or some place. Uh, but I think another factor is uh, that we are so afraid uh, ourselves uh, living in Europe, you know, is, uh, we have a border to Russia in Norway and many countries in, have borders to Russia. So we are uh, feeling my, very much in the same boat. This can happen. If it escalates, it can happen. Of course, not, not when we are a member of NATO, but it can happen. We think mm. it can happen. I think that's important. So my hope is that, yeah, that we can learn something from this crisis and also be more helpful for uh, people from Afghanistan. Yes. Absolutely. And Syria and Yemen and many other places that didn't ignite the global response, and particularly the European response, the way this did. Ricardo, you wanted to say something. Yes. Um... Um, that's what I meant with bringing for its idea and what I think is a chance, as we said, to do something different to what was being done in the League of Nations. Yeah. What resulted from it? Because yeah. when I think about giving an example, is using this for other communities to identify with. So the, the idea is if we are really a global, you know, community mm -hmm. having this representation is that the color, religion, uh, region, mm -hmm. if this is Asia, you know, Middle East, if it's mm -hmm. Eastern Europe, it shouldn't make a difference in the response. Mm -hmm. and, and that is something that you know, makes a difference because it's not neutral. Mm -hmm. the, the response or lack of response generates an effect. Mm -hmm. have a big part of the world seeing very different what's going on in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Even when most of us are horrified by the death and the destruction, mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. something that we're not all agreeing on. Maybe it has to do with this, with the fact that responses or lack of responses generate effects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think also that uh, uh, when uh, you can uh, imagine that people are very far, so you are not so much concerned personally, so you don't want to think about that. You want to, okay. And they come, they come as stranger. We don't want to be identified with them. Okay. But there is another thing that we have to think <laughs> about. That it's true that at this point, the Ukrainian refugees are very looking like all the Euro European. So there is a kind of a sympathy and a desire to help. But tomorrow there are refugees, and there is uh, the possibility of a narciss of the narcissism of small differences because they are refugees, because they are not in a good situation, and so on and so on, and can be something 
which can happen in another time of rejecting them. We have to be very, very uh, alert about this aspect. Mm -hmm. Let's not say that uh, that's okay to have this kind of so strong difference between refugees in Syria, Afghanistan, and so on, and Ukrainian one, but that's for some time. And, and, and another time, we will see the same kind of, of uh, phenomenon going on, uh, because we don't want too much identification with people that are in a very difficult situation. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Part of ourselves I speak about. Mm. That's why I just uh, make such, such a point on the on the aspect of don't kill. We don't have to kill. We don't have to kill also psych, 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 mm. on the psychic way. Uh, and because uh, we can do this, because we have it, that's a possibility. Mm. Just add a bit because I've been studying uh, refugee crisis or movements uh, from happening the last 60, 70 years. And it's a very different way they are received. Uh, from Hungary, it, it was well, in 1956, it was quite well received. Also from Chile, we had a lot of Chilean refugees in Europe uh, and uh, they were. <laughs> quite well received uh, as well but uh, not, not such a large number and then people came from different parts in afghanistan and so on so then the xenophobia was growing in europe and it's the right-wing movement and so on so it's a very complicated situation people it was an image of being overwhelmed which was very much created by uh, the media and so on so, so uh, it is, is uh, and the refugee situation has really grown out of proportions uh, on a world basis. There's too many, and so on. Uh, so, I think your attitude uh, on um, uh, uh, maybe on, uh, using uh, Levinas uh, is really important. Because that's, that's the kind of basic, uh, basic uh, uh, understanding and approach how we meet the strangers, and also, uh, of course, the traumatized is evoking the stranger in ourselves, our own death anxiety and alienation anxiety, and so on. And then we project a lot of things into these poor people who have been traumatized, and so, so it's a very complex situation. But here, I think psychoanalytic knowledge is really important in the public sphere. Absolutely. Let me let me um, bring a question from a, a Romanian analyst. Um, I know the situation of refugees from Ukraine. Um, many people um, that you, from Ukraine came and continue to come into my country. Romanian people react very well. It's a huge mobilization from civic society and administration. All Ukrainian people are very pleased by this welcoming. Many of them are already working now or became voluntary helping others and helping other Ukrainian people who come to the border with Romania. There are solutions for them. My question, says the, the attendee, is what happens with the Ukrainian people who remain in Ukraine? And what is their main reason for their decision to remain in their country? Hmm. Yes, it is. Of course, now it is a, a massive humanitarian humanitarian catastrophe in Ukraine, uh, and for uh, children, for example, uh, uh, older people. Uh, ill people and so on and of course the soldiers are in a very bad situation uh, many uh, are not fleeing because they cannot flee mm. i mean i talked with the colleague ukrainian colleague the, her parents could flee but her grandparents were too ill to flee 
may state. Uh, and this, this, this is terrible things. So yeah. why, why they, some will stay to fight, of course, and to try to save the country. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's uh, such a devastating situation and uh, mm -hmm. difficult to answer the question why they stay. Of course, of course. Uh, yeah. Would you like me to, shall I move on to another question? Because I'm, yes. I'm aware of our time. Eh? Yeah, yeah, um, it's another question for the, for the, the whole panel. Uh, and it, it brings us back to what Viviane was uh, talking about earlier, about leadership. Um, do you think that in order to try, to try to get the balance, it would be necessary or at least important to have a psychoanalyst in each government? Hmm an idea hmm? that's a very good idea that's a very good idea and sometimes it happens to it happens to yeah sometimes it can happen sometimes um, it happens yeah we, we have in, in in the uk we've got john alderdice psychoanalyst yes, yes. psychiatrist mm -hmm. politician we need yeah, to yes. like that hmm? yeah. um Another, it's not a question, but more a comment, uh, and particular thanks to Zvere uh, Varvin. I'm a medical director at a psychotherapy clinic, and we have been asked to help refugees at a refugee activities center. This made me rethink the strategy of how we can help them. How do we stop the acting's arts? the acting arts. Uh, mm. We are living boundaries crisis. <clears throat> mm, mm, mm. Well, can I have a short comment? Because this is what we all know is uh, uh, how people react in crisis, uh, in catastrophes. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of different ways people act. Some act out and scream or do things other, withdraw. The much more problem with those who withdraw. We should take more, we should take more care or be much more aware of those who withdraw, but because they're acting out, they are creating attention and then people need to do this acting out or different things for a while. And then mm -hmm. uh, things may come. So it's trying to contain uh, acting out and uh, special attention to those who withdraw because they they are in more dangerous mentally. I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Ricardo and Vivian, do you, would you like to respond? I, I I thought about this idea of acting out as I think Rosenfeld mentioned that. that that is a way of it's it's it implies some hope to generate some kind of effect in reality. Um, of course, it can include a destructive um, influence in it, but it is withdrawal is is much more about hopelessness. I think um, yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm just keeping an eye on the time, try and squeeze something in, but also give the three of you time to um, say something at the end. Can, can you elaborate on how to navigate the complex situation for people from Russia who live, for example, in Poland, in Germany, and want to help? You know, the conflicts there may include guilt, uncertainty about Russia's future, and the break in the relationship with Ukrainians. They need time. They need time. It's, uh, it's so difficult now. But uh, with time, uh, uh, you have to build relations again. Yeah, they have to tolerate quite a lot of internal guilt and uh, pressure or accusation from the outside. But uh, we need to need to keep uh, calm and keep a uh, uh, calming, uh, accepting attitude because the Russian people are really in, in 
extremely difficult situation. Mm -hmm. And also uh, our Russian colleagues, of course. But it's also very important for them to be contributing, not as silent bystanders. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So they should be included uh, as far as possible in, in this kind of uh, refugee race. But, but it's very sensitive, of course, now from mm -hmm. Ukrainians with Russian, uh, native Russians. But mm -hmm. uh, this, this will work out uh, in time, I think. I think just, yeah. Mm. Viviana, Ricardo? About that, you know, the, the guilt of the, of, the, of the Russian today, mm. or the guilt of the people that uh, are part of aggression, mm. uh, the individual guilt in front of what a government can do, uh, <coughs> I know, know very well Israeli uh, uh, that said something that we have to deal with. And uh, the question is uh, uh, how to, to, to keep with uh, an individual and personal position and uh, try not to make too much generalization also. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a government and then there are people and they are manipulated. And some of them go with this manipulation, and some of them are reacting against the manipulation. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on how much strength they have in themselves, in, in fact. Uh, you spoke, Ricardo, about people uh, with acting out, and uh, you say that we can look at that as a kind of hope, a manifestation of hope. It, it's really a question of uh, each one and what kind of strengths, internal strengths, everyone, everyone has. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, all the question of how to deal with guilt and uh, the fact to be part of. And so we have to act against what's going on in the government and we have to, and we have to speak and we have to act and so on. And, uh, and I think that uh, we have to remember to everyone that uh, not to make uh, uh, systematic generalization. Look at the person as a person. Each one, even though we are in a community, each one is a very singular person. And uh, I think that's something that we have to remind to ourselves. Each time. That's what we are trying to do as analysts, also, I guess. Um, I'm just going to very quick, oh, Ricardo, sorry. Just, just a small Please. comment. Yeah. Uh, but I, 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 I have Russian patients, and I, and I've seen them suffering a lot about this, and I'm very worried about how these feelings can be contained or, or not. Not in, only my patients, of course, but what, something that I think it, it can be useful to keep in mind is to try and think about what is wrong and what is right, not about Russians and Ukrainians or, you know, that's why I think it's so important to um, have a kind of uh, general condemnation of different situations. Mm -hmm. So that it is easier to get there, to discriminate right and wrong and not colors, nations or whatever. Thank you. I mean, there are lots of, uh, very appreciative comments coming into you three. Um, one is very nice. It just says we we may not have answers, but it is good to be part of asking the difficult questions. And and uh, there's one question which we could almost have an entire conference on. What can we do to prevent violence? I'm only asking the question, but we will not be able to elaborate on that. But maybe it's something for us to come back to in, 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 in the future. Um, because I would like to give the three of you just the opportunity to say something very briefly before we, before we have to stop, because I want to say something as well about the next webinar. Would you like to add something briefly? Yes. 
I'm very happy that psychoanalysis is now taking social uh, phenomena uh, seriously. Uh, and they are really going into dealing with war and difficult, uh, very difficult social questions. Thanks. This is a, an advancement from many years of working in the IPA. I'm very yeah. happy. Thank you. Vivian? Très court. Uh, but maybe I will say what something that I understand that Schwer said. I am very happy that uh, uh, analysts today can consider that they have to be engaged and uh, and to stop to be uh, uh, in another place and um, uh, i think that uh, uh, we are dealing with uh, engaged engaged neutrality not really a neutrality we don't have to to be neutral i have spoken about the fact that uh, as analysts today we have to be in an emotional loaded position of responsibility to our, our patient to our the world and I think that uh, the fact that we reach this this uh, point, this uh, this yeah. moment, that's very important because I think that what is taking I have to break because we're running out of time. Uh, <laughs> Désolé, Désolé, Vivian. Okay. Ricardo. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just to say that. Um, I agree with with my colleagues here, and we have a chance to help in a very concrete way. Yeah. Um, please respond to our letters that we are sending through the IPA. For PACE, it, it is very important to be in contact to each one of you that has and, and the chance to help. So we have a lot to do. This is a start. Thank you, Ricardo, and really. I mean, the time has come for us to end, but if you'd like, um, and I would strongly recommend is to continue the discussions about this on the LinkedIn IPA discussion group. Thank you so much to the three presenters and also to Silvia Weinberg, Mariano, Rupertus Honorato, and indeed Matthew Grimley, who were majorly involved in bringing this webinar together at very short notice. And I'm really delighted to let you know um, that there's another webinar, please make the date in your diary, Psychoanalytic Emotional Support in Times of War by Mariana leutzinger Bulliber, 29th of April. So do look at the IPA website and thank you all so much for joining us today for this really important work that is ongoing. Thank mm -hmm. you.